Pat Love with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love online on Saturdays and Tuesdays. And we are dealing with the calling God has on your life, how he prepares, how he uses life, people, situations, all kind of things to gird you up for the battle, to gird you up for your assignment. You know, one of the things that I thought of earlier was boot camp. How a lot of us, uh, we think of boot camp as a horrible experience. When you look at the army and the soldiers that are getting ready to go out to battle, they have to go through boot camp before they're enabled to go. And they have to be strengthened, fortified, and their endurance has to be built up. And they have to learn to deny their emotions and do the work that's ahead of them in spite of how they feel. And it is... I mean, a lot of them have to learn self-discipline. They have to learn to get up at a certain time, eat at a certain time, dress a certain way. Their uniforms have to be uh, creased certain ways and ironed just so. Their shoes have to have a spit shine on them. I mean, the the discipline level, it, it goes up the wazoo when it comes to how soldiers have to prepare and People in the Air Force, I remember my brother taught me about how to do a spit shine on your shoe and what they look for when they inspect you and they, they put you through inspection. Well, God puts us through inspection on a daily basis. We must introspect. We must check ourselves out and keep ourselves in line with God's ways in order for us to be meat for the master's use in order for us to be worthy of his hire. So for those of you who know you have a calling on your life, for those of you who know that God's hand is on you, you know God wants to use you. Some of you have chickened out, but you're still here. And if you're still here, I want you to do this with me. This is a true test. Do this with me. Follow what I do right now. Breathe out. Breathe in. If you did that and you're still here, you're not dead and gone, guess what? God's hand is still on you. He hasn't given up on you. If you have not given up on yourself. Now, the scripture says it's not by power nor by might. That means it's not by your ability. It's not your big skills that's going to get things done, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So as long as you are filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with power, God will use you if you are simply willing. Sometimes you can't sit with your arms folded like we did at school. And we're waiting for the teacher. I'm trying to slow myself down so I, I get what God is saying. You're sitting there in the classroom and you're waiting. You raise your hand with the other students and then you fold your arms and you wait for the teacher to pick you. Let me tell you what God's looking for. You may raise your hand. But then get your behind up off that chair and say what you got to say. Don't wait to be picked. Say what you got to say. Move forward. Be bold. Be courageous. Because, listen, there are many people that are still waiting on God to say, do this and then do that and then do the other. But you look at Isaiah chapter 6. What happened with Isaiah chapter 6? What did God do? Let's go to that right now. Just to let you know, it ain't about just being picked. It's about being willing. If there's an ability and a calling on your life and you know you can handle certain things and nobody else is available to do it, but you see a need and you don't do anything because nobody called your name. Listen to what he says. This is Isaiah chapter 6. And let's fast forward. He sits there. Uh, King Uzziah died. 
A lot of times people or things have to die in our lives for God to get our attention. Okay, then after he died, that's when Isaiah saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. Moving right along, the angels cried one another, holy, holy, holy. And then uh, he said, uh, the post on verse 4, I'm trying to go fast on this part. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Smoke is the, uh, is the presence of God, basically. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Here comes the sorrow, the godly sorrow, the recognition of one's need for God, the recognition that one is not worthy. Listen, woe is me, for because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. How many of you uh, uh, spend your day cussing and fussing, fuming and fighting? Unclean lips, gossiping, backbiting. All right. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims, an angel, unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this had touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away and thy sin is purged. Now, here comes forgiveness. Here comes forgiveness, right? Now it begins. Verse 8, also I heard the verse, the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, he didn't, Isaiah didn't sit there waiting to see what he was going to say. Who are you going to send, Lord? Who are you going to send? Angels? Who's going? Who's going? I don't see anybody. Who's going? No. Isaiah was bold. He said, here am I, Lord. <laughs> I got to say it the way he, I got to make sure I quote it correctly. Then said I, here am I, send me. And guess what he said to Isaiah? Go and tell this people. Now listen, I'm going to stop there because what I'm trying to express is God is looking for willing vessels, vessels that are willing to live for him, vessels that are willing to die for him. That means die to yourself and vessels that are willing to serve him in any way, shape or form. Now, you will find that you, the beginning of your walk with the Lord is oftentimes similar to boot camp. <laughs> boot camp is a hard thing to deal with. That is the hardest, in my opinion, the hardest part of your walk. Because the whole time you're going through boot camp, you're trying to get to know this God that you know nothing about. And you're sitting there saying, Ah, uh, <laughs> what do I do? Oh my goodness, this is hard. Listen, boot camp is a short, intensive, rigorous course of training. It's grueling. Listen, it deals with new recruits with strict discipline. Now, let me say this. The stricter you follow the rules at the beginning, the deeper and the stronger your relationship with God toward the end. God is faithful. He who diligently seeks him will find him. God is not going to remain invisible forever, but part of your boot camp is the seeking. And part of the seeking is the disappointment of not getting to know him one-on-one -on -one just yet. Because God is not only dealing with you and, and, and your flesh, he's dealing with the fact that you have to build up endurance. You have to build up a determination. You have to build an inner discipline, do whatever it takes to get to know God. Do whatever it takes, go through whatever you have to go through to be touched by God, to reach him and get a hold of him. 
All of that is part of it because he needs leaders. He wants leaders to serve him, not followers. Followers in the Old Testament, when you look at Israel, what did God tell the men of Gideon? When, when Gideon was picking the army, God said, you know, gather all the people together that will serve me for war. And they met at the brook. And God only wanted 300 out of all those tens of thousands of people. The, the first group, he said, if you're afraid, go home. See, God doesn't want, he doesn't want somebody that's going to be there one minute, and then the next minute they're going to turn tail and run. They have to be processed a little more before they're ready to serve. But God is looking for people who are ready to serve. Now, there are some people when they first get saved, they don't need to be talking about here am I, send me. No, they need to sit their behinds down and get groomed and go through the boot camp and go through the, the, the drudgery of getting to know this word, of getting to know themselves, uh, gaining understanding, wisdom, getting rid of all their childish ways. All of this is process, y'all. God processes us on an individual basis. He doesn't look at one any better than he looks at another. The bottom line is, as long as we're all staying in his presence, we're in good hands. And God is faithful to complete in us what he has begun in us he's faithful even when we're not he's faithful even when we give him half our best he still gives us all of his best because that's his nature that's the nature of his agape love now what i want to say about all that is god wants us to be mindful of why we were placed on this earth. You know, one of the first things we get to know when we get saved is that we start becoming aware that we're here for a purpose. It's it's the, a mind-boggling thing, but all of a sudden a sense of purpose starts to enter us over time. And we we realize we were not an oops by our mother. We were not a mistake, a happenstance. God ordained for us to be born. God had a reason for us, for me and for you to be here. Now, I'm going to read because I want you to be aware of what God is saying to us. We're going to go to Titus. This is something that we have to be very careful of as we're getting groomed. These are the things that God shows us as we go. Now, let's go to verse cha chapter 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. Unto them that are defiled, and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind, check this out, and their conscience is defiled. So when, here's how you can take your temperature if you're trying to get into a position to serve God. We have to constantly check ourselves, inspect ourselves, compare ourselves to the word of God. If you are making excuses for your fleshly weaknesses, if everybody else is to blame, if you rationalize, well, God understands I'm weak. God understands I'm hurting. God understands I'm lonely. God understands I'm horny. God understands I'm, you know, whatever your case is. Okay. Listen. <laughs> Yeah, God understands, but he doesn't excuse. So if you want to be a true servant of God, he wants to see that effort. There's a, a level of effort that a leader must use. We must fine-tune our conscience. You know how we fine-tune our conscience? 
We fine tune our conscience by reading the word. What does Romans 12 verse 1 say? Verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You hear what I'm saying? You have to discipline your mind. What do karate people do? People who learn self-defense and all these martial arts and all that. I'm not okaying anything. I'm just making a point. They have to learn to do mind over matter, mind over pain. They look at the purpose. They look at the goal and they ignore their pain. They ignore their hunger. They ignore their weaknesses. That is a form of inner discipline. And listen, if you're going to be a leader for Christ, you're going to have to learn to die to yourself. That's a hard thing to do, y'all. When you want to raise up and give somebody a big piece of your mind, you got to learn the discipline of Keep your trap shut. You've got to learn the discipline of pray, don't cuss. you got to learn the discipline of being swift to hear and slow to speak. Why? Because most of us have foot and mouth disease. And see, when you, the more you mess up, the more you can, you can, not necessarily, but you can slow down your own progress. You're going to make progress quickly, moderately, or slowly. You're the one that determines by how diligently you seek him, how diligently you study that word, how much you squeeze the world and its ways out of your own. There are things in character we must lean on. We must watch how Jesus did everything. He is our role model. Why do you think that he came to the earth not only to die, but to live as a role model? So we have to watch how he handled friction. We have to watch how he handled the lies the false accusations. We have to watch how he handled disrespect. We have to watch how he handled backbiting. There's a whole lot of stuff he dealt with, a whole lot that we could never hold up under. But listen, he did all that without committing one single solitary sin. So if you want a role model, Abraham is good, Moses is good, that's nice. Peter and John, you want to associate yourself with them, that's nice. But the role model of role models is Jesus Christ. You want to see what a real leader does? God, when he sent Jesus, when Jesus came down to this earth, and he became a man and started his ministry, you never once saw Jesus Christ Lord over God's heritage. And we see pastors, leaders, and prophets doing it all the time. They Lord over God's heritage. You see choir members lording over God's heritage. See, how do you handle conflict? Do you hold grudges? Do you wish that somebody wouldn't ring your phone because you don't want to deal with them? Baby, you better get that straight between you and God. That is not allowed in a leader. There is not one person in our online church, God's Church of Love, not one person in the churches I've been to that I don't want to be around because I don't like them. 
No, I can't allow myself that. See, when you know you're having issues with anybody, you better ask God to give you the love. As what at Black Eyed Peas say, where is the love? Yeah, you better ask God, Lord, where is the love? Because I ain't feeling it right now. You can't have aught against your brother and think you're going to pray over that aught. You can't ignore their phone calls. You can't ignore their cries. You can't stop praying for them because they got on your nerves because they sinned one time too many and you ain't having it. Well, baby, nobody made you the standard. Jesus is the standard. No human being is. Only Jesus. See, those are the areas of leadership that we have to fine tune ourselves. You see a piano player and he tunes up the, the keys and he hits a note and it's like, bang. And then he hits the tuning fork, and the tuning fork might be a little higher. Dang! And and he's got to bring everything to where it's right there in the perfect spot, the perfect tone. You have to live your life in such a way where daily, every minute, every second of every hour, you are determined to find tune your attitude, fine tune your heart, fine tune your mind, fine tune your actions, fine tune your words, everything, fine tune the love you're supposed to have for your brothers and sisters in Christ. You have to fine tune yourself. You can't walk around like an untuned piano, wearing everybody's ears out. No, you can't do that. You can't be in discord. You can't be in a state of dissension with your brothers and sisters and think God's going to anoint your ministry. You've got to be in tune with God's heart. You have to have the mind of Christ, the heart of the living God and the spirit with his power working in you in order to have the anointing oil flowing from you. If you have aught against anybody, baby, you better clear that up quick. You better hurry up and clear it. If you can't understand somebody, go to God and get the understanding. Ask him, Lord, help me understand. Brother Appleseed, Brother Appleseed really works my last nerve. What is it about them that drives me up the wall? Is it them or is it me or is it both? Help me understand. You have to go to God when you are fine tuning yourself. You don't go around a whole bunch of folks. You go to God because he's the only one that has the right note. He's the only one that can keep you on the right key, keep you at the right level. He can raise you up so that you're not living flat. He can, he can humble you down so you're not living too sharp. See, notes go sharp. You can sing the key of C or any note. If I sing, and I want that to be fine-tuned, I might be singing flat and it'd be, or sharp. See, so you have to make sure that you fine tune your life with God. Because other than that, you're living in a state of dissonance, discord with everyone, including God. Because if you're at odds with your brothers or sister, baby, you're at odds with God. If you think your brother or sister has odd against you, you better go to them or else you're not doing it God's way. Don't avoid it. Nine times out of 10, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're imagining things. The devil lied to you and you're going for the okie doke. So all of this is part of being a leader. How you handle people, how you handle yourself, how you correct yourself, how you receive correction. Do you humble yourself? Or do you rise up and give them a piece of your mind? Open your mouth wide and let them have it, baby. Out of both sides of your mouth. 
Hmm. How do you handle friction? How do you handle confrontation for the sake of reconciling and understanding or for the sake of letting them feel guilty because they hurt your feelings? What is the purpose for everything you do? That's the fine tuning. Lord, check my motor. There are things you never hear me talk about in this church. I, I don't sit here and ask people to give money and give a monthly offering, give a weekly offering. I don't bug people about uh, tithing and offerings and giving and giving. It shall be given to you, pressed down, shaking together, running over. Why? I don't trust my motive, so I keep my mouth shut and let God handle that part of it. If they don't, they don't. That's between them and God, but God still takes care of me. So I'm not depending on my mouth or my manipulation to get things done. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm not using my manipulation to get people to do things, to take me somewhere, get people to offer to do something. I don't use that. See, manipulation is another form of witchcraft. You got to be careful. A lot of people, when they get into leadership, that's what they lean on. Manipulation. They lord over God's heritage. They intimidate. They lay guilt trips. They plant little seeds and thoughts in your mind, making it, hoping that you will operate the way they plan for you to operate by what they just said. Yeah. See, when you trust God, you don't have to lean on any of those little tactics that our flesh tends to use. You don't have to do that. When you really trust God, and if you're having a problem trusting God, guess what? Lord, I'm really having a problem believing in you right now. I mean, I believe you, but I'm having a hard time trusting you with this. I'm having a hard time trusting you with that. I'm having a hard time believing that you're going to come through. Lord, help my, help thou mine unbelief. See, all of this walk with the Lord, all of this being groomed for leadership, being groomed for service, all of this, God uses life to hone you, baby. So you must take that life and take every minute, every moment, every feeling, every thought, every offense, every fear, and give it back to God. He's your source. He's the one that can heal your heart. He's the one that can take your head if it's screwed on backwards and screw it back in place again. He's the one who can balance out your walk and lift you up on your leaning side. He can strengthen you on your weak side, strengthen you on the inner man. He can open your eyes and make you see something you never saw before. He can introduce you to you. And you'll be like, I never realized I was like that. <gasps> Help me, Lord. Then your prayers are more focused. They're more aimed at, at the target. And things get done more quickly. Because now you're not operating only in spirit. But you're operating in truth. Leadership. Do you want to be a leader? Do you feel the call of God on your life? Well, guess what, baby? It's boot camp time. Let's get on it. As I said in that other video, let's get busy. God bless you.